Good afternoon and welcome to the final session for today um, of the 2013 Linux Conference. Our speaker today is Andrew Vanderstock, whose the uh, topic is OWASP Developer Guide 2013, what it means for open source projects. Andrew has been, is a web application security specialist and has been involved in the open web application security project since nearly its inception in 2002. Um, he's held executive director and global chapters committee member positions and wrote the OWASP developer guide 2.0. He has a long, wow. he's the long time moderator. I That's fine. Okay. I I'm hopefully <coughs> Googleable. He is a long time moderator of the uh, semantic security focus web appsec mailing list and is working with the one laptop per child, assisting with porting the One Education Server to ARM and X64 on Fedora 17. Thank you. Okay, so this is actually not the first time I've spoken to Linux.conf.au. The last time was in 2002, when I basically told you about what I do for a living, which is essentially auditing software for security issues. And, um, well, how did that work out for me? The reality is, is that it didn't work out at all. Um, it literally, nothing changed. If anything, things got far, far worse. So what this is, is essentially an extreme tale of hubris. So I basically thought you guys would be interested, you'd suddenly become adept at doing security things, or at least get your security interest peaked. And it didn't happen. So what do, I, what do we need to do to change that? And that is the focus of today's talk. Because effectively, what's been happening over the last 10 years is the security industry has been talking to C-level executives. But they, when they talk to developers, it's like, do it this way. But the dirty little secret of our industry is we're not developers. We don't know the best way. And some of the things we suggest are just outright wrong. And some of the things that you think are right are also outright wrong. So what we need to do is actually come together and hopefully get there. How many people here like Java? Yep, a few of us around. Good. This is my bread and butter. When the Department of Homeland Security is busy telling everyone to get Java the hell off their desktop, that's pretty much the death knell. This is not like VB or COBOL obsolescence. This is literally get it off all computers now. That's really job threatening. Now, there's a lot of code out there. It's not going away anytime soon. But unless Oracle can start getting this stuff right and really just sort of roto-rooting it absolutely from top to bottom, Java will be off all computers of any classified sensitivity because it can't be trusted. Okay? And don't think it's just about Java. We've got problems with uh, Ruby on Rails recently. How many people are familiar with the YAML problem? Yeah, has everyone literally in the last day or two updated the Ruby on Rails so that you don't have that problem now? Okay, well then the rest of you need to go and do like, you know, update whatever, however, whatever mechanism floats your boat, but you've got to do it because you know what? My PHP server that runs out on the internet is getting hacked with this YAML thing. And it's really annoying because mod security just goes, yeah, go away. But for you, they're getting it. They're running commands on your server. Today, right now, active exploitation. And if that keeps on continuing, Ruby on Rails will be out of the hosters. You won't get the um, cheap Heroku type deals anymore. It'll just go away because it's too dangerous to run. And that's the problem. It is really threatening to our livelihoods. The other part of the problem is that a lot of the security industry is very invested in selling new things, particularly tools. And the other dirty little secret, and it's admitted openly here by the guy who writes F-Secure's, like it's the chief research officer of F-Secure, one of the major antivirus firms. They didn't get Stuxnet for five years. Five years. If anything says to you, you know what we're doing? We're selling snake oil? Well, this is a, a mea culpa, which is awesome. But not too many AV vendors will tell you that. In fact, Symantec keep on telling you all about how you need their stuff endpoint protection these days to protect you. The reality is I create new viruses all the time to do my job, 
and I never get troubled by antivirus. So is it an effective control? Absolutely not. And in fact, the DSD top 35, is there anyone in here responsible for this? Because if you are, huge pat on the back. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, this is the best thing since sliced bread. It's extremely actionable, which is the main thing. Every single thing on here you can do. Everything is achievable. The top number one, does anyone know what the top number one is? Exactly. Don't worry about antivirus because they can't tell you what to do. It says you're going to run Outlook. Okay, what does Outlook look like? It allows only Outlook to run and you have a white listing of applications. If you are running in a, um, like more or less a SE Linux type world, you can do the similar sort of things where you can basically force just trusted applications to run. You need to do this. This is number one. Because people like me come up with new and interesting ways of owning your cell, um, servers all the time. And if application whitelisting was available, it would be hard for me to do what I do. Down at number 25 here, we've got, uh, oh, actually 21, sorry, antivirus software. So they don't think you should do antivirus software before 20 other things. In the top four, which by the way, they say if you did the top four things, over 85% of all the things that are bad out there would be blocked. Two of them are patching. Just blocking stuff that we know is bad, like the Ruby on Rails problem. So as a person who's written quite a lot, um, the developer guide is 390 pages, the OWASP top 10, which got incorporated into PCI DSS. How many people are familiar with PCI DSS? Yep. Section 6.5 is the OWASP top 10, in particular the 2007 variant that I was responsible for. The introduction of that said, this is not a standard, please don't adopt it as a standard. So that's what PCI did, they adopted it as a standard, and now you've got this terrible standard that is really hard to comply with, because it was never meant to be a standard. It actually goes through the 10 worst things that happened in 2006. Now, luckily, that doesn't change very often, but it's still saying you shouldn't do these things over here, but it doesn't tell you how to build a bridge securely. It tells you how to avoid certain types of bridge faults. Not all of them, but if you need the bridge to stay up all the time, it's not the correct way of doing it. It's not good security engineering. And that's the other thing. Essentially, what I did here is I taught the hackers how to hack. I did not teach you guys how to code well, how to do security engineering, and how to incorporate security into everything you do. And that's a real problem because you can see it. 2005, when the OS guy came out, the, the number of problems started skyrocketing. It wasn't because you guys did a much worse job starting in 2005. It wasn't because the really good programmers retired in 2005. It's because we learned how to hack programs. And unfortunately, the work that we do, I come, is very, is extremely rare that I don't get through. Like, uh, how many people were at the uh, security talk this morning, which was just awesome? He just demonstrated, oh, absolutely. It was a fantastic talk. I'm definitely buying you a beer. <laughs> um, <laughs> that basically is, you're never ever going to protect against that sort of an attack. Like literally don't even bother trying to protect against it. Do the things in the top 35, absolutely. It might make it much harder, but it's still not going to be the end all. But that's not the quality of the attackers that we face. The quality of attackers we face run Ruby on Rail attacks on PHP servers because they're dumb. But you know what? At the end of the day, all they're after is a bunch of servers that run commands. They don't care if they do it for three days, 10 days, a million days. They know they're going to get a number of servers. They don't really care that they do it on IIS sponsors or PHP servers. They don't care at all. They just know that sometimes it'll be a Ruby on Rails box, and then they'll have effectively whatever Apache is running at. So, come on. What really comes down is, is that the business requirements did not include me as a threat model. And this is where it comes, it, it's really hard to say, what is the crazy stuff that's happening up here that you're not putting into your software? Because I can tell you now, what I do is actually really structured. We have a methodology which really hasn't changed in about 10 years. Information gathering, analysis, exploitation, pivoting, extraction, or if it's just simply I want that box over there, 
you know, signing your name all over the binaries, whatever you want to do. The reality of our job is I like to steal from you. My job is to break your application. And I'm moderately good at it because I think evil. You need to think evil. Abuse cases must be there. So, my mouse has died. Oh, no it hasn't. So, we often come up at the end of engagements. I think you might be familiar with this site. This is awesome. If you're not familiar with this site, you've definitely given these excuses. No one will do that. That's my favourite because I did that. And I wasn't trying very hard. What are you trying to do? Harm our industry? The other one is risk management often comes up, it's just going to be too expensive. We're going to accept that risk, which is just the dumbest thing. You know, at the end of the day, if you're not going to take any countermeasures, you're not going to bother to detect it, and you're not going to fix it, you may as well just bend over and take it. It's not acceptable to accept risks if you don't understand the risk. And the problem for us as security professionals is to communicate that to you in an easy to understand fashion so you can actually take the appropriate steps. You as developers need to understand what we're actually telling you. Just because it's never happened to you before doesn't mean it doesn't happen every day. Okay? That's a really important thing. So, what are some of the key things that I feel have failed? Number one is, Agile has replaced Waterfall. Waterfall had all these stage gates that security could slot in, and it was really nice. We could say, okay, at this particular stage gate, we're going to do a little security check here. Everything moved along. If it wasn't quite right, it probably just crept along a little bit further, shuddering, but then it would keep on going. But Waterfall had its own problems. At least 25% of all projects failed. Okay? And so the business was always looking for someone who came up with better excuses as to why the failure occurred, and Agile took over. So now we just ran out of time to implement the things they asked us to do. We still deliver, so there's much fewer failures, but the reality is, is that Agile has actually deliberately thrown away anything extraneous to coding, to testing, to actually delivering. So when you actually think about what's happened to Agile, a lot of the things, the old stage gates have gone away. So every few weeks, you have, a, you have a sprint, you have milestones, you go and deploy all the time. And with the rise of DevOps, we've actually seen pretty much someone's going to press the go button every few hours, maybe every other day. Security processes don't work that fast. So what do we have to do? The only answer is to throw them away. But you can't do without security, so where does it belong? It belongs with you. Okay? So fundamentally, I need you to also think about the fact that risk assessments, the business don't understand them, they accept risks that are silly. We can do them until the cows come home, we can tell you what we think, but in the end I've seen some ridiculous things let through to the keeper, and they just don't get fixed, because it's either, like for example, one app I did recently is an absolute dead set rewrite. 2,500 affected parameters, realistically 15 minutes per parameter, putting in a test case, probably another half an hour, making sure that integration testing works properly. You're looking at pretty much two or three years worth of fixing, or you could just start over, because it's not that big an app, it's only 130 pages. You could just start again. The reality is, I can tell you what's happening, they're just going to fix the things that I found and documented, and they'll leave the rest to someone else to find them. Well, we've talked about that. The other part of the problem is, is that the stuff that I do, auditing, the reality is there's not enough security professionals in Australia or the world. What we do is extremely specialised. It takes a while to get to where we are. It's not exactly rocket science, it's just breadth. You really do need a lot of practice and you need to do it regularly. Um, it's not something as a developer you need to know. It's sort of like performance testing or good documentation. If you're not good at it, it's not going to be your calling. But if you are good at it, it's an excellent field. But the reality is, I struggle to recruit. We often have to bring people in from overseas because there's not enough people who are good in Australia. And that obviously ends up with excellent salaries, which, you know, is a good field. But it doesn't scale. I can't come in and do a proper pen test or a proper code review of your app every day. I just can't. So 
we need to put in some controls to help you with that. The other thought is that how many people here have actually ever done an undergraduate or postgraduate like formal security subject? One, two. That's remarkable because the reality is if you're trying to build anything, even as an architect, now architects aren't, this is the architecture course from Melbourne Uni, architecture does not require you to understand every single, like do finite set analysis or whatever it is that um, checks for loads. So they can, are the designers that come up with the buildings and the way things are. They do need to understand what will and won't stand up, but the fundamental load things are done by engineers. Now, fundamentally, the engineering version of this course has a few more engineering subjects that basically teach you actually how to calculate those things. Unfortunately, we are sending out graduates. This is from Melbourne University again. Melbourne University has not one subject at all, not one single lecture on risk management. We are sending developers out there with no training. Literally, there are no qualified people to write programs in Australia. There is a syllabus from these um, set out by um, CMU, which is now approved by the ACM, which is the American Computing Machinery people, and IEEE. And those particular things, it's been defined since 2010. Now, I know it takes a little bit of time to reju rejuvenate your syllabus, so if you do work at ANU or UNIMEL or RMIT or anywhere like that, come see me. I will show you them. The reality is we need to change that so that every developer has at least one subject for one semester somewhere in the first three years of their tertiary qualification that actually talks about security. If architects have risk management and basic, this is how buildings stand up, we can do that too. And by the way, um, anyone here from ANU, from the computer science or engineering faculty? I could not find your syllabus. <laughs> the site that says what this is, it doesn't actually have that. <laughs> Frameworks have failed you. Realistically, as developers, we reuse frameworks all the time. Our API is what makes Ruby on Rails that much more um, better, if you like, than doing it in another language. It's not just the syntax, it's also the things that are surround the language to make it a very productive environment. It's the reason why people use Spring MVC. It's the reason why people choose to use whatever language floats their boat. It makes them, the APIs make them um, you know, productive. The problem is that the basics of security are just not there. Wherever there's red, the frameworks that come off the main site just do not have that control at all. You shouldn't have to scratch around to find in a web application framework how to authenticate users. You just shouldn't. The only apps that don't need that are static web pages. You aren't using a web application framework to do that. If you're doing anything non-trivial, you need an authentication page. It doesn't have to be great, it just has to be there. So there are plenty of alternatives out there, and if you're a good programmer, you'll know what they are. But the worst part is, is that I actually looked at some of the Ruby on Rails ones, and they had some fantastic things, like in the Ruby on Rails security guide. Anyone here responsible for that? Um, okay, no worries. It actually tells you that the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog is an excellent password. It's a much better password, I suppose, than password one. But yeah, that's the number one password. Okay. I've got some word lists here. These are pretty much, if, if you have a bad password, I've got it. Just yell out your password to me, honest. I'll, no one will know. Um, <laughs> I'm going to look for what this particular guide suggested is a good password, and then we just see whether or not the various um, word lists that I have actually have this inside. Now, I have an SSD, but these are you know, quite big, there are several. 
some of them are actually many gigs in size. I'm going to let that finish <laughs> while we go back. For what it's worth, Microsoft actually figured this out about seven, or actually probably going on eight or nine years ago. They actually do have good things. The membership provider is pretty good out of the box. You don't have to do too much to make it useful. It is actually pretty good. It salts and hashes passwords. It does a few other things for you. Spring MVC, similarly. Because it's got the Spring security modules there. Things like CRSF. Does anyone here not know what CRSF is? OK, CRSF is just for the record. It's basically forcing victims to do what the attacker wants through the authenticated um, session. It's effectively, it's forcing users to do things because there is no uniqueness about the request. If you have cross-site scripting, you automatically have CRSF problems regardless of whether you have a CRS nonce or not. So many of the major frameworks now have CRSF protection, but most of them don't. And if you don't know that, you're going to be let down. And so we still come a lot, of, a lot probably 60% of apps that I review don't have CRSF protection. Coupled with the 70% of apps that have um, cross-site scripting, you know, it's a terrible problem. Users will definitely, is there any children in the room? Users will definitely click shit. They just will. You just email them whatever you want, you know, here's the report from last week, double click this PDF, blam, we've got your internals. At the end of the day, what I really want you to understand is that we've tried. We've tried really hard to do user education and it improves from 70% of people will click stuff down to 20%. But if you're only looking for one person to open something, you're going to get that person. And lastly, the tools. <coughs> we will sell you lots of tools. They do wonderful things. And then they are basically like the juicer, the waffle maker, the, you know, the whatever other useless kitchen implements you've got, like the thermomixers. Anyone got one of those? Unless you know what you're doing, tools are useless. If you don't put in proper processes around a tool, it's worse than useless. If you put an IDS in and then leave it, it basically listens to nothing. And then no one's actually looking at it to actually respond to it. Tools are not the answer. They are part of the solution, but they are not the answer. Now, I'm going to blow your mind a little bit. It comes back to this hubris thing. I've basically been saying all this bad stuff, but the reality is that the conversation has to change. We know what is wrong. We do. But the reality is, is that we can't fix it without you. I don't know all the answers. I know most of them, and I have firm views on them. You've probably guessed by now. But the reality is, is that I do not know the answers that will work for you. So what I'm looking for out of the rest of this session and any conversations you have with me here or on email is essentially help us out. What can we do to improve the developer guide so that developers will actually pick it up and say, yep, that's actually something that I'm going to look at, I'm going to keep, and I'm going to keep on improving my craft. Because that's the thing. I've done a lot of developer training. Every time I've done developer training, the developers have always loved it. They wanted to improve their craft, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. It's an element of something that you need to do all the time. Do you need to be experts? No. Do you need to know about it? Yeah. So you are the solution. I can't be there all the time. In fact, with Agile and DevOps, I am not there. Okay? So the reality is, is that you need to be the solution. Okay? Has anyone come across? Um, I've got his name here. It is David Guletner. This is, a phrase, this is a manifesto he wrote in 2000, basically predicting the cloud, the rise of mobile devices. I mean, in 23,000 words, what he wrote back then was insane. Absolutely mad. Like, absolute, like, English in a hot summer sun, mad. Barking, mad. And then you read it today, translate what the phrases he uses into our modern, like he calls the cybersphere. It's the cloud. You translate the word, one word, and it automatically makes sense. And he basically predicted it all. 
And in fact, one of the phrases he used was, could Amazon.com be an itinerant horde instead of a fixed central command post? He wrote that in 2000. And he talked about data. Users don't care about computers. They care about interacting with data. I'm going to talk to you more about this swarm idea when we talk about access control, because honestly, what we've done in the past will not work. And I'll show you why. Oh, by the way, that's the slide about fixing the education. There is actually a syllabus. Please, if you are in any shape, form, or influence, I can give it to you. It's free. It's approved by ACM and IEEE. It is a valid computer science syllabus. Please, come and talk to me. So, fundamentally, these are the five things. I know, Wish I hadn't have done it in that way. Focus on systems and software. That's why I love DevOps. DevOps does that. You are now focused on, I can deploy myself a cloud of machines that actually represents my entire block in no time. And I care about the security of that. It functions in the intended manner. It is free from accidental or deliberate vulnerabilities. It provides security capabilities. We've talked about that talked about that. Code snippets. I've basically been pulling my hair out reading Ruby on Rails security guides and advice. And it's terrible. It's awful. It's so dire. It's like, it's like what you should not do. It's better than no advice, but it's sort of like telling people that there's a Santa and then making them believe it for a very long time. And then saying right at the end, by the way, there's no Santa. No, don't do that anymore. Please help me fix the snippets. The snippets should not be insecure. If you're going to display something on the screen that takes user input, please do the basics, input validation. It was CS101, lecture one. <laughs> so what am I doing? Well, there's the developer guide. We are totally re-architecting it. It was literally a list of all the bad things that could go wrong. And you know what? That was pretty good for 2005, but it was basically a really good guide for us to develop checklists from to test your code. But it wasn't a great place for you to learn how to secure your code. I have now come to the point of view that that's the wrong way. I need to tell you the positive artifacts that you need to put in your code, like input validation, that need to be there. And you know what? That's really small. I'm hoping to be less than 300 pages, even though I'm adding 16 new chapters for things like cloud and mobile devices and things like IPC because you know what? The days of us having a single computer that has the entire application are gone. With these things, you can get some really gnarly race conditions that are fantastic. If you think race conditions for security are new, they're oh, oh so no. Who remembers Big Brother the first time around? They rewrote their code in another framework that ended up having a shared race condition. So essentially, a piece of memory was basically shared between users of all types. So every time a registration came through, the only information you never saw was your own registration record. They had to shut that thing down for two weeks while they worked that one out. And that was basic threading. We only found out in 2007 the math library that comes with Java and .NET is single-threaded. So everybody who was doing crypto work using the standard math libraries, basically, if there was two certificates being generated at once, you had a terrible certificate. But how can you tell? No one does has any clue as to whether it's good or not. So essentially, this is a comprehensive dictionary. It's not designed to be read to cover to cover. It's designed to be a textbook. So to help with it, because I realize that could be daunting, and more to the point, I'm going to be making it wiki only. There won't be a book version of it anymore. It needs to com um, constantly evolve. OS con Proactive Controls is coming up. It's about 13 to 14. I'm having an argument with another guy at the moment. And um, you know how when the politics are really useless, they're very vicious? <laughs> the reality is, is that we're still deciding what they will be. But these are fundamentally the things that if you don't do them, you will have insecure software. If you do them, you've got a chance. Okay? It is designed to be a standard. It is literally, do these things, 
and you'll be better than most people. If you only need to run faster than the slowest human to run away from a bear, you'll be fine. And it gives you advice on how to get back to where you need to be. We want evidence-based controls. How many people here have to change their password every 30 days? How many people know that you can, I can crack all of your passwords in five and a half minutes? Okay. I'm going to demonstrate that right now because it's an interesting thing. Oh, by the way, that's all the times that uh, the quick brown box came up. So let's go to here. What I've got is, let me just do a head of it. Um, P text. Basically, I have got a car forum. It has a bunch of users' names and passwords and everything like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my GPU to crack it. Yep, cleared everything out. This is when you need cut and paste. Yeah, it's around here somewhere. <laughs> so I'm going to use the OpenCL version of John the Ripper. And it's going to load up um, two of my GPUs. And so it's loaded 13,000 hashes. And now it's basically, it'll actually crack about a quarter of them straight away just by GPU cracking. It'll get the rest before the rest of this presentation is done. And people just, oh, we'll just because it is actually, Data, I will just kill that off. Um, people do choose terrible passwords. They just do. So I want evidence-based results. What you won't find in the developer guide is advice to do 30-day passwords because it's broken. We have to move off passwords. Passwords are done. They've been done for 10 to 15 years, but they're done. Done, done. Done, 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 done. So basically, controls must be in place, they must be in use, and they must be effective. There's no point in telling me telling you something about why it's effective if I believe that to be so, but I haven't got any proof. Okay? So registration pathways, for example, we know there's a good way. You shouldn't have to implement the bad way and then for us to come through and say, by the way, that's bad here, chunk. That costs heaps of money to redo. If you send clear text passwords to me, you're going to get a bad report. Why are you sending clear text passwords to me? What we're going to do is we're going to document registration paths that don't actually mention that you can send clear text paths. So you implement that, you're not going to get a bad report. Cheaper, much cheaper, much faster. But more to the point, we're going to tell you, you know, if you don't really need to have usernames and passwords on your system, why not pick up OF2 and go off Twitter or go off Facebook or whatever, or Google? You know, you don't need usernames and passwords. If you want to have a social community, you really don't need them to be yours. And then I want everything to be tested. And there's got to be a payoff. Part of what makes a great community is that I want you to win too. Okay? I can't just say do this and then expect you to do it because I say it's a good idea. I want you to win. And the way you win is you enable secure business. Back in 2005, I was involved in the, um, the NAB rollout of SMS authentication. That was a fantastic program. And it enabled us to do things that no one else could do for a while. Now, I can't really talk about it in public, but the reality was is it was wildly successful. And it's the reason why pretty much if you don't use it today, you have very low limits. And it enables things that they just couldn't do before. Think about that. We enabled using a security measure that feels like it could be really clunky and awful, but we made it so that it was easy enough to use that it was actually better for password resets than the previous path. And then we enable things that you just can't do in any other banking institution. That is fantastic. I really, that's the sort of stuff you need to think about. What could you do if you were secure? So secure requirements. People often think, hey, let's just do that. And then you just go, that's terrible. The thing on the right-hand side there is shared knowledge questions, questions and answers, the bane of my existence. How many people here have got a double-barreled name? I, yeah, no one. Okay, it ha oh, sorry, over there. Yep, your mother's maiden name is in your name. So everyone knows that. But more to the point, to famous people, there is no such thing as a shared secret. 
there are, there's nothing that they could answer honestly with these questions that someone else wouldn't know. Thank you. So the reality is that I want you to think about removing those full stop end of story. They are useless, okay? Please don't do it. We're not gonna document them in the new guide. And captures have problems with accessibility. Yeah? What about the ones where people specify their own questions? Are they any better? No, because people choose terrible passwords. Terrible passwords. I always choose, this is gonna be a hint for you. Uh, sorry, I wasn't talking about choosing the password, I was talking about choosing their own secret Yeah, no, no, people will always go, what's my mother's maiden name? The other part of this is, is that all the information security policies we have say don't have reversible passwords. This is automatically a password because it recovers access to your account. So it's automatically, like if you want to get rid of these things, you use policy. That, you have to store that in reversible encryption. We've said from ISO you know, 7799 thousands of years ago, don't do that, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. Okay, so what the thing I want you to think about, security is a bunch of stuff. I want to think about defensive services. We've been thinking about SSL and firewalls since the year dot. But do you know what? I do all my pen tests over um, SSL and through a firewall, and I never get detected. Or if I do get detected, let us go, oh, he's a tester. The reality of the situation is, is that we need those basic services. I'm not saying get rid of them, but you need other things as well. You need enablement services, things that allow you to do things you can't do today. And you need an identity and access management, and you should not have to write that. That should be an enterprise service available to you, whether you choose to use Google's, Twitter's, Facebook's, or the membership provider from .NET, or hopefully a well-written one from Ruby on Rails. So essentially you're adding Access control, enterprise security API, and authentication. It reduces the number of users down to a manageable amount. You can reduce the attack surface area of your application to those that you've got a relationship with. All of a sudden, many of your problems start to go away until I come along. But I'm the special case. So please don't put maximum limits on password fields. There should be no reason for that. Access control. This is where I want to talk to you about Swarm and why I think managed access control has failed. Bradley Manning allegedly stole 400,000 cables using a direct object reference attack. That was a managed access system, as far as we can tell. The people who obviously know aren't gonna say. But the military continues to sign up for managed access control because it's what they have, labeled security. The reality is managed access control works very well when you've got a machine that's sitting in a room that's locked and everybody you can access it is well known to you, and that's a small number of people. It works terribly in the modern environment where there are more devices than people. And we're already at that point. If you go to the average corporate network, you will find more devices than people, and you don't know what they are. You can add a guru plug, and then put Pornium on there, and away you go. You, can, you will not have that found for weeks. And that's got 3G access into someone's network. We have to start thinking about a better security model, and over the next 18 months, I want to work on it. I'll need your help to actually think about swarm models that actually work. But realistically, all con security controls fail. You need to have a detection mechanism and then someone to look at it later on. Please, like, pretty much I break into your applications by mashing on the keyboard. I don't want to do that anymore. Please put input validation in. It's called fuzzing and there was at least one talk on it already, um, it's really worthwhile. Our fuzz lists are available to you. It's called jbrofuzz, and it's got hundreds of fuzz lists. Just stick them into your unit um, tests, run them through your app, and see what breaks. Because I will, and I don't want to be finding that. Then, output encoding. People talk about SQL injection and all the other sort of things, and it's sort of like shock and awe. 
I can basically, I can show you tools that will basically break through your application like soft butter. And it's not magic. People think it is magic, but it's not. It is literally the same old strings that I've used since 2001. And all I've had to do over time is learn the proper SQL grammars for three different major, like MySQL, Oracle, and um, what's the one from Microsoft? MS SQL. I've had to learn the different grammars. That's actually the hardest thing. I shouldn't do that. Honestly, we've got good solutions for all of these things. The encoders are there if you want them. But how many people know how to do DOM injection? Very few. Do you know that your uh, AJAX library is doing the proper DOM encoding? Probably it isn't because they don't know how to do it. You need to work on that. But having SQL injection in this day and age is actually pure negligence as far as I'm concerned. OK, so my first thing about data protection is if you don't need the piece of data, throw it away. It's not there to be stolen later. It's actually a key design control. Please don't keep data you don't want. But if you do need to keep it, think about what would happen if a collection of that ended up on the newspaper. What would happen to your business? And in my personal past history, you get much more business. It's terrible, but reputation damage rarely ends up being bad for the organisation. But the reality is it can be ending. Card systems out of the US basically went out of business because of this. Detection. We've talked about detection a little bit, so I'm going to skip ahead. Those of you using DevOps, I love you, I love you, I love you. Please keep up that. Automate everything. Please make sure that your code um, is built and hardened. We can add a little bit, and you can build a hardened dev server, a hardened UAT server, and a hardened production server that all are alike. That makes my job awesome. If you start from a, like a hardened point of view, you're going to make our jobs that much harder. If you've got old stuff and you're like Maven repositories or you've got like old libraries, like for example, um, Spring MVC was relying on a particular thing that ended up having OGNL injection. There were like 1,400 Java libraries that depended on that component and all of them became vulnerable overnight to OGNL in, um, injection. If you just simply <laughs> updated your libraries on a regular basis, you would not be vulnerable to OGNL to, um, uh, injection. If you don't know what OGNL is, you need to just keep up to date with patching. You shouldn't need to know what OGNL injection is because it was <laughs> fixed. It was fixed two years ago. But if you're running an old version of JBoss or an old version of WebSphere, I can guarantee you that I can put some special EL into the input fields and run commands on your server. And that's not good. Lastly, just have some form of evidence of assurance. That's all I ask, is that you've done the unit test, the, the integration test, to show that you're actually secure. The controls are there, in place, you use them, and they're effective. If you can show me those things, the likelihood is I'm not going to be able to break into your system. I can concentrate on the business logic flaws, and they're a whole separate other thing. So um, I've done most of the demos, and those who wish to go beering right away, obviously, but questions, any questions? Yeah, oh, sorry. You mentioned uh, Facebook and Twitter integration. Yep. Um, isn't that just centralising as a central point of failure there? I mean, what happens when those things get broken? All of a sudden, all of your websites and all of the things that you are, your whole online identity gets broken at once. That's true, but Facebook in particular has actually done a really good job of making that very hard. Like, my wife got her password, which was, by the way, is in the top 100 um, of bad passwords, which I made her change. Um, but because I put on two-factor authentication and pre-approval <coughs> devices, the person from Poland who typed in the correct password couldn't recover her account. So fundamentally, if, unless you can actually do two-factor authentication for free, um, have password recovery without having to type in, like, what's your favourite mother's maiden name, and all the other things Facebook does, they do a better job than you can. And so, yes, there's availability problems. What happens if Facebook goes the way of MySpace or um, what's that one that was like Friendster? <laughs> you know, you do need to think about how your integration with other third-party services that don't control you, as Instagram found out, um, is sometimes not a good thing. But it can be a pretty safe bet. If you don't like that, there's other alternatives like Phone Factor. Um, there's a few other ones as well. If you type in Phone Factor, I'm sure all the SEO people have actually worked out how to get it in there. Um, 
Ping identity, Ping identity does a very good job. Oracle has a great IAM stack. You can do all of those things, but they cost a lot more than using Facebook. It really is a business decision. What do you want to do? Um, how big was that word list that you had? And wouldn't um, having stuff like SHA-256 make a lot of that much harder to do? Yes, computationally, SHA-256 for salting is almost impossible. And in fact, rainbow tables are very difficult. Mm. Like, you just, you're not going to do it. So the correct approach, as you point out, is SHA-256 for salting. And that would prevent that. We only have time for one more question. What's your opinion of multi-round MD5? <laughs> it's pretty much the same as MD5 as far as I'm concerned. Um, I can crack on this computer, which is an i7. Uh, Six billion, no, sorry, I think it's three billion. I'll, I'll do a um, benchmark a little bit later. Three billion MD5 rounds a second using the GPU. Billion. And so if you do it five times, you divide it by five, but you're still not that hard. Um, thank you for your talk. Nice. On behalf of the organisers and Linux Australia, I'd like to present you with a small gift. Oh, thank you. And if we could thank, present in the normal way. <laughs>